The next item of business is topical questions. In order to get in as many members as possible, I'd be grateful for short and succinct questions and responses to match. And at question number one, I call Tess White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with INEOS regarding possible restructuring at the Grangemouth refinery. Minister Mary McCallum. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Grangemouth is a source of critical infrastructure, energy resilience, skilled manufacturing and high value employment. And as we would do with any business of such significance, Scottish ministers and officials routinely engage with Grangemouth operators. As for the member's reference to the refinery business, it would not be at all appropriate for me to comment on any media speculation regarding the commercial matters or potential commercial matters of any one company specifically. Um, however, the Grangemouth cluster, with its world-leading engineering experience, expertise, assets and low-carbon manufacturing potential, should play an important role in our net-zero economy, and we continue to work closely with the industry and key businesses there to help harness that potential. Tess White. Thank you, Minister. As you just mentioned, the Grangemouth refinery is one of the most strategically important employees in Scotland, with hundreds of staff across the site. They will understand and understandably be alarmed by the prospect of restructuring at the refinery. What discussions has the Scottish Government had with INEOS about the retention of jobs at the site following these reports, and has the Grangemouth Future Industry Board convened to respond to this worrying development? Minister. Thanks, Presiding Officer, and I must um, thank the, the member for the question, but reiterate that which I stated in my previous answer, which is that it is not appropriate for me, for Scottish Ministers, to comment on what is media speculation regarding the commercial operations of uh, a single organisation or company. However, the member is right. The, the, the Grangemouth uh, cluster and the, the skills and the workforce there are exceptionally important. The refinery and surrounding businesses in the Grangemouth cluster provide for a major source of highly skilled manufacturing jobs and world-leading engineering expertise. Um, these jobs make for tremendous potential supporting a just transition to our net zero. Uh, economy and, as I said, Scottish Government ministers and officials continue to engage with industry and with businesses at the complex to foster that potential. Tess White. The Minister does recognise that Grangemouth is important. Grangemouth accounts for 4% of Scottish GDP and 8% of Scotland's manufacturing. As a critical national infrastructure, it supplies two-thirds of petrol and diesel in Scotland, as well as the jet fuels for airports. A change in outlook for the refinery's future has wide-ranging and wide-reaching repercussions. What assessment has the Scottish Government made of the economic impact of potential restructuring, as well as the impact on energy resilience and fuel supply? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And again, I thank the member for her question, except I have to, to point out once again that it is based on media speculation, and it's not appropriate for Scottish ministers to comment on uh, the terms of that or the implications of it. However, what I am very keen to stress to the member and to the chamber is that future-proofing this vital industrial hub and working in partnership with industry is our objective and will help to support a long-term, sustainable and vibrant future for Greenmouth, uh, for all those who live and work there, and for all the reasons that the member set out in her question. Michelle Thompson. Um, I am aware, of course, and it has been mentioned already, the, the Grangemouth Future Industry Board, and I think we can all agree the hub that is the skilled manufacturing and high value employment in Grangemouth. But can the Minister outline a little more uh, detail around the role that the Grangemouth Future Industry Board will play in ensuring that Grangemouth, regardless of any restructuring, continues to play to ensure a key part in the transition to net zero? Minister. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Um, and the member raises an important question, which um, I have to say it will, will hopefully answer the, the part that Tess White raised regarding the board, which I neglected to, to answer previously, so apologies for that. Um, but yes, the Scottish Government established the Grangemouth Future Industry Board in recognition of our continued commitment to, to the cluster, both today and in the future in our net zero economy. 
Um, the board brings together key partners and decision makers to work with industry and to actively plan for that all-important just transition for the complex. And in doing that, we're seeking to unlock investment that boosts the innovation, longevity and competitiveness of the site. In terms of next steps, the board will initiate and lead on the design of a just transition plan for the Grangemouth Industrial Cluster. In line with principles of a just transition, this plan for the complex will be built up. It will be built collectively. It will be built in consultation with a wide range of invested stakeholders, and that shall include, of course, industry. Julian Mackay. Thanks, Presiding Officer. I grew up in Grangemouth and know how important a just transition will be for workers, the planet and the communities that surround the Grangemouth refinery. The community needs the Scottish Government to do everything they can to deliver a just transition. Does the Minister agree the future of Grangemouth depends on a just transition away from fossil fuels, which is led by the local communities and trade unions, who must be involved in future decisions around the plant and should be represented on the Grangemouth Future Industry Board? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I thank the member for the question, and I know that her connections with the area will uh, make her uh, feelings here very acute. Um, the Scottish Government's position on the need for the fastest possible just transition to net zero is clear. Um, Grangemouth, as I have said, with its skills, engineering expertise, manufacturing potential and assets, could play a very key role in enabling Scotland's just transition to net zero. And to help realise this, as I said, we recently established the Grangemouth Future Industry Board. Um, and as I said to Michelle Thompson, in terms of next steps, the board will lead on the design of a just transition plan for the cluster, and this will be built in line with just transition principles. And as for trades union dialogue, the Scottish Government will always engage closely with trade unions as a matter of course where their interests are concerned. Thank you. Question number two, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. In advance of asking my question, just draw members' attention to my register of interest as an owner of a rented property in North Lanarkshire. To ask the Scottish Government what preparations it is making to support people in Scotland, in light of the reported comments by the Chief Executive of Scottish Power warning that 10 million UK homes could potentially be in fuel poverty this winter. Minister Patrick Harvey. Uh, energy costs do, of course, lie at the heart of the cost of living crisis, and this government is committed to doing everything within our powers to support those who need it. Uh, that does include the £150 cost of living award to support households with higher fuel costs, but also a further £10 million uh, being provided to continue our fuel insecurity fund. We are also set to invest uh, almost £770 million this year to tackle cost of living pressures through family benefits and other unique social security payments. And crucially, uh, we're also committed to investment of at least £1.8 billion over the next five years on heat and insulation uh, for Scotland's homes and buildings, with programmes already being enhanced and increased. More does need to be done, and powers, of course, relating to energy markets set at UK level. We've repeatedly urged the UK Government to take urgent and decisive action to support households, both in in the immediate and longer term, like a one-off windfall tax on companies benefiting from significantly higher profits during the pandemic and the energy crisis and the temporary removal of VAT on any energy bills. We are actively engaging with the sector and with stakeholders, such as through the Scottish Energy Advisory Board, uh, of which the Chief Executive of Scottish Power is a member, to explore what more can be done. And we believe that all four nations should be involved in planning to address this crisis that affects people throughout the UK. Mark Griffin. I thank the Minister for that answer. The first part of the solution to rocket and fuel costs is to put money in the pockets of the people who need it most. Scottish Labour had a plan to do that, but was ignored by the Government in favour of mirroring the unfair UK scheme. But the second part of that is to make people's homes as cheap to heat as soon as humanly possible. And last week, the existing Homes Alliance set out a framework of practical and financial support to de decarbonise our heating systems. But the energy cap will go up in just four and a half months. And so the underlying principle to reduce heat demand ahead of time is even more urgent this year. Now, will the government come before Parliament before recess and set out how many homes they can insulate before this winter? Minister. Well, I'm sure uh, Mr Griffin does know that we already have a very active programme of work in this area, and we have already announced uh, over the course of this year in response to the cost of living crisis, significant expansions uh, of it. Uh, responding to the, the crisis this year, we uh, boosted support through our long-standing programmes 
uh, which have already supported over 150,000 uh, households in or at risk of fuel poverty. We are widening the eligibility criteria of the £55 million Warm Home Scotland Fuel Poverty Programme, uh, which will provide an offer of support to over 7,500 households uh, this year. We are increasing the level of funding uh, for individual fuel poor households uh, through the £64 million local authority led area based schemes. Uh, we are expanding the Home Energy Scotland advice service to help uh, households keep their homes warmer and reducing bills. The capacity to support an extra 12,000 households a year, uh, and we are doubling the offer to vulnerable households. Mark Griffin is right that energy efficiency is one of the most urgent things that we need to do, so I hope that he will join me in calling on the UK to revise its woefully inadequate energy security strategy, which said nothing at all about energy efficiency. Mark Griffin. That, that was indeed a glaring omission in the UK government's part that I hope they rectify as soon as possible. But the insulation loan equity scheme that has been reported has left homeowners out of po pocket and left solicitors looking at these agreements absolutely shocked. The number of homes Warmer Homes Scotland has helped with energy efficiency measures being installed has fallen every year since 2016. And just two weeks ago, the government, in a response to a parliamentary question, has admitted that the Home Energy Scotland marketing scheme has wound up for now. Now, will the government reboot its campaign, ramp up direct engagement with every single homeowner and landlord in Scotland, so that householders can get the financial support to make improvements before this winter? Minister. Well, I, as I said in my uh, previous answer, I have given several of ex examples of where we have and are continuing to do expanding not only the eligibility but the scale of what we are doing to support households uh, who are facing fuel poverty and to support all of Scotland uh, in the transition to uh, renewable heat as well as high levels of uh, energy efficiency. I think Mark Griffin knows that we are committed to doing that on as fast a, a scale and pace as we can. But to achieve that throughout the whole of Scotland is a multi-decade task, a multi-decade task, and cannot be compressed into the space of a few months. Uh, I'm quite happy to, to write to the member with any other information that he requires about the uh, ambitious programme of work that we have in this area. But I hope that we'll be, find uh, that there are colleagues on the Scottish Labour benches who will work with us constructively, not demanding the impossible but pushing us to go as far and as fast as we can. That is what we are committed to doing, and I hope that we have the support of the whole chamber in doing that. Eleanor Whittam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister agree with me that whilst the Scottish Government can use our devolved social security powers to put more money in people's pockets and mitigate the harms of escalating fuel poverty to a point, together with signposting assistance available through organisations such as Citrus Energy and Ayrshire, it is the UK government that holds the levers for delivering meaningful support to citizens, and if they, if they fail to do just that, they send a strong message to all struggling families that they just don't get it or they just don't care. Minister, well, it is very clearly a, a matter of fact that the powers to regulate energy markets remain reserved. Uh, for example, the proposal for a uh, a £1,000 cut to energy bills that came forward from the Scottish Power Chief Executive uh, in his recent interview. That is only deliverable with the powers that rest with the UK Government. We have repeatedly called on the UK Government uh, to take uh, other actions, including uh, a temporary cut on uh, energy bills through uh, the VAT, uh, reviewing the levy costs on bills, action on the warm home discounts, uh, and uh, trying to create a Four Nations discussion to develop an effective response uh, to the energy bill uh, increases. Uh, I'm disappointed, and the Scottish Government is disappointed, that the UK Government have failed to support hard-pressed households and failed to engage with us on a multilateral basis uh, to achieve more, uh, such as could be achieved with a, uh, a one-off windfall tax on excessive profits, whether from the oil and gas industry or anywhere else. Uh, that's the scale of work that is needed, and I hope the UK Government uh, feel that it's not too late for for them to change direction uh, and listen to such proposals. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Given the failure of the UK Government, even in today's Queen's speech, to support those on fixed incomes with a horrendous rise in the cost of living and energy, and given that 40 per cent of pensioners entitled to pension credit do not claim it, and that is currently £182.60 a week if you are single, £278.70 if you are a couple, with the Treasury keeping over £300 million a year in unclaimed pension credit in Scotland alone and UK-wide 
It rises to almost 1.8 billion in unclaimed uh, uh, benefits. Does the minister agree with me that the level of money retained by the Treasury in unclaimed benefits is a disgrace and that it should direct its energies into helping people claim those benefits to which they are entitled and that would at least give them some help in meeting those living costs? Minister. Uh, well, I think Christine Graham is not the only one who was uh, slightly surprised at the lack of action in the Queen's speech today on the cost of living crisis, but she's also uh, right to point to unclaimed and underclaimed benefits as a, a very obvious thing that can be done uh, to maximise household incomes uh, of making sure that people are accessing the, the money that they're entitled to. And it is a disgrace that... Uh, the, the figure I have here is 1.7 billion, but if it's 1.8 billion, I, I stand to be corrected, sitting in government coffers at UK level instead of in the, uh, the, the pockets and purses uh, of pensioners who need it so badly. Uh, this government will continue to place an emphasis uh, on uh, income maximisation schemes, uh, and there's a great deal that we can do to support people to have the information they need about the benefits they're entitled to, uh, and I hope that the UK government will take similar action. Question number three, Beatrice Wishart. To ask the Scottish Government what action it will take to provide local support to new mothers who require a specialist mental health bed with their baby, following recent reports that many are having to travel hundreds of miles in order to receive the treatment they need. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. All women who require a specialist mental health bed with their baby are able to access mother and baby unit provision. Mother and baby units provide treatment and support to approximately 115 patients per year. The treatment provided by these units is highly specialist care to the small number of women and their infants who experience severe perinatal mental health difficulties and require more intensive support than can be provided in the community. Mother and baby units are open to all women across Scotland based on clinical need and not geography. Uh, we recognise that there are barriers associated with receiving treatment away from home, and that is why we opened the Mother and Baby Unit Family Fund, which supports partners and families with the cost of travel, accommodation and other expenses whilst visiting a mother and baby at an MBU. And we are currently undertaking an options appraisal, which will evaluate potential options for increasing mother and baby unit capacity. We have a live consultation open until 31 May to hear from parents, partners, families and practitioners from across Scotland, and that is on the Scottish Government we website. Also, we have been closely working with colleagues and health boards in the north of Scotland to support the development of community services in their areas so that the right support can be provided at the time it is needed. In recent months, both Highland and Grampian launched their community perinatal mental health teams, which will improve access to specialist treatment. Beatrice Wishart. There are no dedicated inpatient mental health beds for new mothers north of Livingston. Shetland and Livingston have a contractual agreement for perinatal mental health services, and my constituents are expected to take a long journey by air or sea with their newborn. Does the Minister agree with the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Scotland that there is a postcode lottery facing new mothers when it comes to perinatal services? Minister. Um, President Officer, as I pointed out to the Chamber in my first answer, this is very specialist care accessed by 115 mothers and their babies uh, in the recent year. Um, we are looking at, to, see what, to see what expansion is required, uh, but one of the things which we need to do and are doing uh, is actually ensuring that the right community support is in place across the country uh, so that we can provide that support in the community where that is what is required um, to ensure that services uh, in the north of Scotland are as good as they can be. What I would say to uh, Ms Wishart um, is to uh, encourage her constituents in Shetland uh, to respond to the current consultation, which is extremely important, uh, and we will take cognizance uh, of what people across the country have to say about these services. Beatrice Wishart. I thank the Minister for that answer, and I will encourage my constituents to do just that. The P&J have been campaigning to raise this issue of perinatal mental health services, with one report highlighting the difficulty faced by partners travelling to support their loved one and to see their newborn baby. And it's easy to see how costs can rack up for families as grandparents and other children make visits. 
Each family is different, and health care provision should strive for equitable support where there are big distances for travel involved. The maximum claim back cost for the family fund is £500. That is almost like one airfare from Shetland, and that money should cover travel, subsistence and accommodation. So will the Scottish Government look to increase the criteria and financial provision provided to families engaged in perinatal, perinatal mental health services, especially those who live furthest from services? Minister. Uh, President Officer, our first aim uh, is to uh, strengthen community services so that women do not have to access the mother and baby units unless that is entirely necessary. Uh, and I hope that Beatrice Wisher uh, will support us in our efforts in that regard. Uh, in terms of um, the costs uh, for visiting mother and baby units, as I, I outlined in my first response, uh, we have put in place the mother and baby unit family fund. Uh, I am more than willing to have further discussions uh, with Ms Wisher around about the experience of her constituents um, in accessing that fund uh, and, seeing, uh, uh, and looking to see whether we can do anything else in that regard. So happy uh, to correspond or to meet with Ms Wisher on that particular issue. Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister, of course, is aware of the report that the Health, uh, Social Care and Support Committee did on perinatal mental health and my own personal interest in uh, perinatal mental health in Grampian. Can the Minister outline further how the increased community support for new mothers' perinatal mental health is improving outcomes from them and, and, and their babies, and outline any new measures being taken to identify and treat the symptoms of ill mental health early? in new mums and mums-to-be, particularly in those rural areas. Minister. Um, I thank Ms Martin for her question, and I recognise her interest in this, not only as the convener of the committee uh, who uh, had the inquiry, but also uh, as a North East MSP. And I know that she has been in contact with the Latin and Mothers Group. Uh, as have I. Um, and the government uh, is funding, is putting in additional funding for community specialist mental health services in every health board in Scotland and inpatient services for women and families with the highest level of need. Also investment in the third sector across 33 organisations providing perinatal mental health support to women and families and uh, funding to support the voices of lived experience. And the voices of lived experience have been vital in helping us formulate our current consultation on how we move forward with perinatal and infant mental health uh, in this country. And once again, I would encourage everyone out there who has an interest to respond to that consultation. Uh, and I would applaud uh, the work of Latinum and other women's groups uh, across Scotland uh, for putting uh, this issue uh, to the fore.